As the public debate over growth continues, many authors, scholars, and just ordinary people have weighed in on the discussion. We have found a clever video that asks the question, what is too much? From Leo Murray at the Royal College of Art in England. Give me that. This really isn't about polar bears anymore. At this very moment, the fate of civilization itself hangs in the balance. It turns out that the way we've been calculating the future impacts of climate change up to now has been missing a really important piece of the picture. It seems that we are now dangerously close to the tipping point in the world's climate systems. This is the point of no return, after which truly catastrophic changes become inevitable. Think of it like this. For the past three million years, our planet's climate has always been in one or the other of two stable states, with small changes in solar radiation providing the energy to push us from one to the other. When we're in this cooler dip, the planet has an ice age. When we're in this warmer one, the planet's climate is very much as it is now and has been throughout the whole of human history. The problem is that our use of fossil fuels is pushing us further and further out of our little stable dip and up the far slope of this hill. The tipping point is the point at which we cross the peak of the hill and we no longer need to keep pushing to keep the planet moving towards a much hotter place. It will just keep rolling onwards all on its own. This tipping point exists because of a set of positive feedbacks in the climate system mechanisms that can amplify the effects of man-made warming and lead to runaway change. Each feedback in the system has its own internal tipping point and it is the relationships within this complex, mutually reinforcing system that have been missing from our climate prediction models. So far, we've only pushed up global temperatures by around 0.8 degrees centigrade. But because of the 40 or 50 year time lag between emissions and temperature rise, the emissions already in the atmosphere commit us to raising temperatures by around another 0.6 degrees over the coming decades, which could easily be enough to place us right at the peak of the hill or even over it. If we do pass this critical threshold, global temperatures could soar by as much as six degrees. If this happens, the natural world will suffer a mass extinction event which will wipe out the majority of the plants and animals with which we currently share the planet. Although there will be a lot more rats, flies, cockroaches and mosquitoes as the world's ecosystems go into meltdown. The first human impacts will come in the form of steeply declining access to fresh water. As rainfall patterns change, glacier-fed rivers dry up, and rising sea levels contaminate reservoirs. As crops fail, forests burn, deserts spread and coastal regions flood permanently, people will start to pack up their things in their billions and move on in search of a better life elsewhere. But where? Humanity may survive this, but what will humanity mean in a world where countries which remain habitable, like Britain, spend most of our remaining resources fighting to keep out the starving millions who can no longer live in their own countries because of what we have done. The world is awash with weapons. Enough firearms to arm one in every seven human beings on the planet. As the world's ability to support the huge numbers of people alive today dwindles, we will not die peacefully in our sleep. Okay, here's the good news. None of this is inevitable, yet. This is not the time to panic or to despair. This is the time to act while we still can. We need to recognize that there is a huge question mark over whether governments and corporations are capable of responding to this threat in the time we have left. They've had 20 years already 
and still have less than nothing to show for it. This is because they remain committed to a doctrine that prioritizes endless short-term economic growth over the survival of human life on Earth. There's no great mystery about what we need to do to reduce emissions in line with the science. We simply need to consume less. But that is out of the question in a society which is founded on the ever-increasing consumption of material resources and energy. Nobody has all of the answers, but we do know that this is not the only way to live. And given that it's almost certainly going to kill us all, we'd better start looking urgently at some of the alternatives. It's now very clear that in order to actually win the fight against climate change, making big changes to the way we each live our own lives is not going to be enough. We're also going to have to actively confront powerful vested interests who will stop at nothing to prevent the changes we need from taking place. We have to be more than just consumers. These are extraordinary times. Preventing runaway global warming is the single most important task in all of human history, and it's fallen to us to do it. If we don't, then everything else we work to achieve in our lives Dumb. will be destroyed or become meaningless. Dumb. Those who came before us didn't know about this problem, and those who come after will be powerless to do anything about it. But for us, there's still time. We better get a move on, though.